here with you tonight. It's an honor for me to be invited in the memory of Rabbi Marcus Breger. Thank you, Esther, for making it happen. <coughs> it's an honor for me to have this lecture in honor of your grandfather, David and Judy. Rabbi Breger was an amazing leader, leader of the community, an amazing scholar, an amazing thinker, and a man who devoted his life to serve this wonderful community. So I'm really honored to be here with you today. And he will continue his tradition of learning and teaching by learning a little bit more tonight about the Exodus from a totally different point of view of the story. So how many of you thought that it's quite unusual to have a professor of management and leadership going to talk about the story of Exodus. I'm sure that when you saw the invitation, you were thinking, what's going on here? Is it going to be a serious talk, yes or not? Mm -hmm. So I owe you an explanation, and I would like to start with that. As the famous quote says, in order to know where you're going to, you need to know where you came from. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I ended up being both. My story starts in the age of 14. I was 14 years old when my father took me and my brother to see the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was 1981, the famous movie of Steven Spielberg, which completely changed my life. I saw this movie, and at that moment I, know, I knew right there that I wanted to be an archaeologist. I was 14 when I started digging in Israel, and right after the army, I started my studies in the Hebrew University, in the School of Archaeology, and also took some courses and learned the field of Egyptology. It was very obvious for me, after a month of studies, that Egyptology would be my field. It's unbelievable for me to feel that an experience that started 34 years ago, now you know my age too. <laughs> I would never think that this movie got me so close to almost finding really the lost ark. And you will understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. So my life turned, my life turned in that way that I couldn't continue in 1988 to be a scholar in Egyptology. I had to reinvent myself. I moved to a different country, went and studied a different field, organizational development, as Beth spoke about. And I became a consultant and finally a professor of leadership. But every Passover, and we are getting close to Passover, as you know, I was talking about the Exodus. It was the topic of my, my thesis. And I wanted to keep this tie to Egypt, although I couldn't pursue my career anymore. So for the last 18 years, I give lecture around Passover. I've become very popular around the world <laughs> with this field. But something happened that changed my life completely 10 months ago and brought me back as a scholar and a researcher in the field of Egyptology. So, you are the first audience that is going to hear my story, why I came back to Egyptology, why I'm so excited to share what I have to say tonight with you. And I just want to explain that my approach to the field of Egyptology, as Beth mentioned, is dealing with the language. I'm a philologist. If you are not familiar with the word, Philology, it means the etymology of the words, of the names, researching the roots of the names, and by that, revealing the real meaning of the story, the real meaning of the text. So this is my specialty. For instance, let's take some example. How many of you are familiar with the fact that Moses is actually an Egyptian word? Okay, we all know Moses. 
Moses lineage in ancient Egyptian, it has several meanings. It can mean a child, it can mean to be born, to be conceived, to create. All these meanings comes from the word mess, messy in ancient Egyptian. Another word that would be also familiar to you, I believe, is the word pharaoh. Okay, how many of you knows that pharaoh <coughs> is actually an ancient Egyptian word? What you have here in the slide is actually a titulary of an Egyptian king. You see, every king in ancient Egypt got the same titulary, which is every king in ancient Egypt is the king of the bee and the plant. Usually you write the first name of the king in a cartouche. This is the circle that you see right there. I will point. Oh, sorry. Right there, this is the cartouche, okay? This is the bee and the plant. And at the end of this big name, you have the word pharaoh, which means the big house. The same thing as in English, we say the White House. So everybody understand that the White House means the president, right? So slowly, slowly along the years, the word for palace, per a, became the word for king, pharaoh. So these are two examples that you know, are familiar with our language. So we have Moses, we have Pharaoh. And here I would like to share with you what happened 10 months ago, the event that completely changed the way I see the story of Exodus, that happened with my mother in one of the nicest restaurants in Jerusalem. So in order for you to understand my story, I need to share with you where I'm coming from as part of my education. My father is a professor of history. He's an athlete, doesn't believe in God at all. He's all about facts, science, and research. He's, he wrote several books about the Jewish history in Europe. My mother, on the other side, is very religious. She has a group of women. She studied the Zohar, the Kabbalah and believe strongly in God and in all the stories of the Bible. So this is how I grew up, okay? In between these two worlds. So I decided one day to be a good, good daughter and I took my mother for her birthday to celebrate her birthday in a restaurant in Jerusalem. And then we're having dinner, we are chatting, it's nice, the atmosphere is getting warm, it's very nice. And then she asked me a question that usually, when I heard this question, I would be very frustrated. She asked me why you went to study Egyptian and to study these awful people of Egypt and not being even one day in a Jewish seminar. From all the people of the world, you could choose just the worst. <laughs> so usually this kind of question and talk would lead me really to an argument, you know, and, but I don't know what happened. The same night, I really took the challenge and I said to my mom, I said, mom, you really want to understand why I'm so fascinated about the ancient Egyptian writing? She said, yeah, I really want to understand. So I said, you know what, I'm going to teach you how the system works. And I'm starting to explain her that when you read a sign in ancient Egyptian, or the sign that you see behind me, you can actually understand the sign by four dimensions. In other words, the sign can reflect the meaning of the word. So if you see a B, you understand that the meaning of the word is a B. But sometimes you can just take the phonetic sound of the word and combine it with other signs and creating different words. So you never know if what you see is the picture or just the sound of a different word. Of course, there are rules to that, you know, there is grammar, but we are not going to go there. But I explained no doubt that there are four dimensions of working with sign. And she was looking and she said, Galit, this is amazing, it's like the pardes. Exactly the same thing in the Bible. We have shat, we have drash, Right? 
Remy saw, so it's like, okay, I, I get it, you know? And we continued to, the talk and talk, and she was like, she said, wow, there are so many things that are similar between your system and mine, so we are not so far from each other. And then she said, you know what? Can you teach me some signs? Can, let's see if I understand how it works. So write me some hieroglyphic sign, and I want to experience that. I said, okay, so let's try. So I wrote her these three signs that you see right now on the flip chart. The first sign I wrote is the sign of Messi, like we saw Moses. Okay, I thought that it would be a great idea since she's, you know, very much close to the Bible. Let's give her some Moses. So, Messi. <clears throat> then I wrote the sign of life, the Ankh. Okay, so we have Messi. This is another S. And we have the Ankh. Phonetically, meaning the sign of life. So my mother starts playing, you know, with the sign, and she's very happy, she finds Moses, that's great. And then she's looking at the signs, and she's saying, Galit, look, if you combine all these signs together, you can get the word, exactly. I hope I write it correct, I'm not sure the A's. You get the word, Messiah. So at this point of the conversation, I was like, okay, mom, this is why I don't like to talk with the religious people, because no matter what we are going to approach it, which sub eventually everything goes back to the Messiah thing. So she said, you know what? You're right, let's leave it there. But I have to tell you, there is quite a resemblance here to the word. I said, okay, okay, let's leave it. So we ended up, you know, having a nice conversation, a nice dinner. I go home, open my email, open my computer, preparing myself to the lesson of the next day. And then, you know, I'm taking everything out from my pocket and the napkin goes out. Looking at the sign, it's already 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, I'm playing with the idea, saying to myself, actually, my mom is right. Grammatically, it's true that I can combine these signs together and being close to the, to the word Messiah. This is crazy, but I never opened the dictionary for 18 years. Maybe it's about time to see if this combination exists in ancient Egyptian. So I'm opening my dictionary and I see that there is a, a combination which is very famous with kings. Every king is a messy aunt creates life, bring life. I said, wow, interesting. But I wasn't so happy with the word Ankh. You see, because it has a nun inside, it has the N inside the word, which is not quite Messiah. You know, if you really wanted to be Messiah and to be accurate, I had to find another sign that will evoke exactly the same letter as the Hebraic letter. So after looking and looking and looking for a long time, I found another sign. Which was the moon crescent. So this time I got my messy Yah. Because the name of the moon crescent is Yah or Yah in Hebrew. So I felt that I knew something, but didn't understand quite well. I said, well, this is interesting. Let's open the concordance and see if there is some resemblance to the word Messiah in the Bible. So it's already midnight. I'm looking for all the words of Mashiach, Messiah, in Hebrew, in the Bible. And here is this quote. In English, but you abandoned and you rejected, you conceived with your Messiah. Suddenly, in the same quote, I have the word conceived, like my messy, 
and I have the word Messiah. So I thought, wow, that's a great coincidence. Same quote, conceived, the meaning of Messi in ancient Egyptian is conceived, create. And right next to it, the word Messiah. But what about the moon part? I mean, where is my crescent? So I get the, the conceived part, but is there connection to the word Messiah and the moon? And right there, I found another quote, which is right above the one I found before. Like the moon, which is established forever, and it is a witness in the sky, eternally true. I said, unbelievable. Here is also the moon. So I'm going to sleep very happy with what I found. I thought it's a very exciting thing. Didn't understand quite what I was looking for of what happened, but I felt like I got to something. Didn't understand what exactly at this stage of the research, but I felt that I'm getting close to a new thing. I'm calling my father who lives in Paris the next day. I said, Daddy, you won't believe it. I have to share with you. I have an exciting thing to share. I'm telling him the whole story about the dinner with my mom. And look what I found. A resemblance with the quote in Psalm and the word Messiah. I'm telling him the whole sign things, everything. And he's like, okay. I know exactly what's going on. You are divorced now for the last two years, right? You are not dating anyone. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. You feel that you want to be close to God. It happens. <laughs> you have nothing. What do you have? You have a bunch of sounds, some signs, some resemblance, some great coincidence that all of them are in the same pursuit. But this is nothing. If you really could find that the meaning of Messiah, the story of Messiah, the redemption, the liberator, the one that will bring peace onto nation, the whole beautiful message is there. Maybe we, you are on something here. But for now, what I see is a bunch of sounds, a woman that is working too much, <laughs> get yourself a man and just go out of there. <laughs> so you can imagine that I, I was frustrated but also very motivated. I said, okay, okay. But if I find something that is connecting me to the liberator theology, are you... <coughs> Are you willing to listen to what I have to say? He said, yeah, 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 of course, sure, sure. <laughs> of course, you will not find anything, yeah. <laughs> so this is how my research starts. I was so motivated to see whether this is just beautiful signs bringing together or there is much more to it. And I was amazed to find that the word that we are talking about is actually the first name of a very famous king. We call him Yachmes in Hebrew, and we call him in English Achmose. I don't know if you are familiar with the name. You are? Achmose was the first king of the 18th dynasty in Egypt who expelled the Hyksos. Hyksos are the foreign rulers that conquered Egypt in the Delta, Eretz Goshen, where slavery happened, and were expelled by this prince of Egypt. When I thought to myself, this is amazing, because I have also a connotation of the liberator, right? Achmose, in the eyes of Egyptian, he was a messiah. He is the one who liberated Egypt from slavery. But when you see the writing of Yachmes, I don't know if you see the difference between my writing and the writing of Yachmes is a little bit different. 
because in this writing, the crescent comes first. So the reason Egyptian would write the crescent before the Messi, because they wanted to honor the God. The name of the God should always be written first, but when you pronounce the name, you are reversing, okay, the reading. In other words, you should read it like that, Messia, which goes back again to our Messiah. So, is it just amazing that we have now even a figure, an historical figure, that has the same name, the first name of Messiah? We even know how he looked like. We even have his ring. We even have his mummy in the Cairo Museum. So I was playing with the idea, I said, what is really going on here? What am I saying? That we have a Messiah? Okay, that he is Egyptian. But the story reminds us so much of the story of Exodus. Is it possible that we are talking about the same story, just from two different angles of the story? And if we really want to go further, is it possible that Ahmose could be Moses? Just a crazy thought. One of the things that struck me, that all the king of the 18th dynasty bear the name of the moon in their first name. You see, for each part of the moon, you have a different name. There is a difference between when the moon is a full moon, when it's a crescent. So all the forms of the moon would have different names. But the common name from the moon god, the Egyptian common name from moon god, is Tchot or Honsu, never Ya. Ya is very rare, the same Ya that we have. It appears once in the 12th dynasty, in the times when <coughs> Israeli tribes came and settled in Egypt, and it appears only with the king Ahmose, that's it. It's not a common name also for the Egyptian. So I decided to discover a little bit the, the moon aspect, I mean, I didn't know much about the moon, except that it was a very well, uh, that it was a divinity who was worshipped mainly in the matriarchal time by women, connecting to the moon. Women always felt connected to the moon because of their menstrual period, okay? So, but I didn't know much about it. So I decided to, to have some research. I researched it for almost then four months to learn a little bit about the moon culture. And the theology of the moon speaks about, this is a theology that was mainly worshipped by nomads. <coughs> nomads were related more to the moon, we can understand why. They were walking mainly at night. It was a theology that spoke about embracing change, moving forward. It was a theology about wisdom about respect, about the value of life. It was a beautiful theology. And one of the things that I discovered too is that this theology started in Mesopotamia. Some would say that it even started earlier with the ancient Arab tribe in the area of Sinai, on the desert of Sinai. And the two main centers of the moon cult were in Ur and Haran. Does it sound familiar to some of you? Who was born there? <laughs> Abraham, good. So, um, unbelievable to see that, okay, Abraham also came from Ur and Haran. Now, if you study the names of the moon cult, what you get are also some interesting facts. You see, the moon in Mesopotamia had two different names. One was Nana, the full moon, and the other name, the crescent, was Sin. If you continue in your research and you will study ancient tribes in the area of Canaan, you will also discover that this moon has another name, which will be very familiar to you. Yud-Kei-Vav-Kei, Yehovah. 
Another name that is also familiar was discovered in Egypt, the yud Hey, the Ya. So suddenly, just by studying the moon theology, you get so familiar with some of the names, some of the theology. I was also struck to discover that one of the artifacts of the moon is the shofar, okay? The ram horns. We found them in different sides. <coughs> and why? Because they have the shape of the crescent. So all these small elements, and I could go on, on, there is much more, but we don't have much time to share all of them today, just led me to another question in my research saying, if all these small parts, okay, were part of this ancient world, is it possible that we have also some traces of the moon in the story of Exodus? Because if I believe that the Ahmose story can be the other side of our story, should we find the moon also in the story of Exodus, in the book of Exodus? By the way, the book of Exodus in Hebrew is not the book of Exodus. You know that, right? The book of Exodus in Hebrew means the book of names. I think we should go back, by the way, to this translation, because there is another message here. If you understand the name of the story, maybe you have a chance to understand the story. This is exactly what we are doing tonight. Because you see, if you really read in between the lines the Bible, and you remember the journey that Moses took the Israeli tribe, he took them to Mount Sinai, which has the same word as sin, the same ancient Mesopotamian moon god. Is it just another coincidence that we have sin as Sinai? Is it possible that Mount Sinai had another meaning, another hidden meaning in the story that we were not aware of it. Maybe it was not just a random mountain that we passed on the way, but maybe it was carefully chosen. We have also the word sne, the bush, right? The miracle when Moses saw for the first time the angel of God. Also sne, sin. So slowly, slowly, as a philologist, as you know, this is my field, it's like digging really into the roots of the word and really revealing here another layer of the story, maybe. So I was curious enough to say that I never saw sin anywhere except in my research, but I never saw sin as one of the name of our God. But, of course, here it is. Song again, unbelievable, another coincidence, the same chapter as the Messiah. Some quotes before. Adonai Eloi Tzevaot, Mika Mocha, Chasin Ya, the Emunatcha Svibutecha, which is quite amazing to see Chasin next to Ya. You came back to again. Is it possible that Hasim doesn't mean only mighty, but it can be also another name of the same God? So I went and studied another name in the story. So we have now the moon God, okay? We see we have the Sin, we have Sinai, and so on. But there is another famous name in the story of Exodus that I would like to share with you tonight, and it's the name of Ramses. Now, I know that this name is very familiar, and I know that Hollywood did a lot of work with this name, and I know that most of you think that Exodus took place in the time of Ramses II. I also thought for a long time that it was that. I don't think it anymore. This is for another lecture. But there is this name in the Bible, and by the way, in the Bible, it doesn't mention that this is the name of a pharaoh, but it is a name of a land, of a geographical place, maybe a city, a store city, who knows. But 
the interest that I would like to bring tonight is like this name also bear another secret of the story. Because you see, Messi Yach is almost the same as Messi Ra, which Israel says. If Messi, Ra, if Messi Yach means being conceived or created by the moon goddess, Messi Ra means really the opposite, being created or conceived by the sun god, exactly. So here we have these two entities, the moon and the sun. And if you know some Hebrew, and I hope you know some, you also know that the word Ra, which is the sun god, means in Hebrew evil, a bad thing. Is it another coincidence that we are using the word of the sun god, the Egyptian sun god, to mean evil, bad things. Or maybe it's just a reminder of an ancient conflict between these two theology. Because you see, the theology of the sun means something completely different. If the moon was worshipped by nomads, the sun theology was worshipped by farmers. They needed the sun in order to cultivate their land. The sun theology was about preserving, protecting what we have. It was about rules, it was about order, it was about organization. It wasn't about moving forward. They were not embracing change. By the way, if you go to Egypt, and you will see a wall in Egypt, it will be very difficult for you to make a difference between a wall of uh, 1000 BC and a wall of 2000 BC. They all look the same. You really need to be a specialist and a scholar to see all the differences. It was all about maintaining the Egyptian canon, and Egypt was the center of this sun theology. So I started asking myself, is it possible that we have here a story and a conflict about two theologies? Think about it as a political arena, okay? Two parties. I don't want to say who is what. <laughs> One believed embrace the change, other embrace the status quo. Is it possible that the story of Exodus is actually a story that reveals and deals with this conflict. Because you see, when we speak about the moon theology, it's amazing how we preserve even in our modern language the area as the fertile crescent. Don't you think? It's true that it has the shape of a crescent, but maybe the fertile crescent also keeps an ancient meaning of this theology that we are talking about. And Egypt was right on the other side. And right in the middle, you have the land of Canaan. Right there in the middle, in the middle of these two mega power. So imagine that this war is going on and all happens in the time of Ahmose. <coughs> And we have an amazing stella by the name of the Tempest Stella in Achmose that also brings an amazing depiction of the catastrophe that happened in time of Achmose. And this is the eruption of the volcano, the eruption of the volcano of Tira, which is Santorini, the island of Santorini. We know today by scholars, by Richard Rittner and by Nomi Moller, who already mentioned that in the 90s and now published again in 2014 at the JNES article about the connection between the story of Ahmose and the eruption of Tira. So imagine the scale of the natural catastrophe that happened at the same time of this war is going on. We know also that this eruption was 20 times bigger than the explosion of Hiroshima. We know also from the same scholars 
that all the things that are happening when the volcano is erupting are the same and goes well with the 10 plagues. By the way, you should read their article, it's fascinating. They really tell the story of the process of this eruption and connecting it to the 10 plagues of the story. So think about it. This is this war going on. At the same time, Santorini is on fire. The whole region has changed completely. Thousands of people are dying, continents are sunk. The land completely changed. This is chaos. This is Tolga Bowl. And right in the middle of it, you have Moses taking the Israeli tribe and more, Erev Rav. I believe that this Erev Rav are other moon worshippers who were oppressed by the sun theology at a certain time in the Delta. And he's taking them to the promised land. Now, I know that some of you will say, but Galit, look, it's very hard for me to go with your story because Achmose is an Egyptian king. I mean, you saw his name, he's inside the cartouche. He's an historical figure. <clears throat> is it possible that the Bible gave us quite a hint and a remez saying who was really Moses? Because you see, all of us, including myself, we saw amazing movies. I don't know how many of you saw the Demille movie, right? <laughs> we saw Moses, Charlton Heston, beautiful, handsome guy. <laughs> but he looked like a nomad, right? With a beard and everything. We also saw other, even some cartoon movie, but we had this image of Moses as being a slave, as being a nomad which is very difficult for us, even for scholar, to detach and to rethink and reset our thinking and to think that maybe Moses didn't look like that. We know that he was Egyptian, but we believe that he became a nomad after he left Egypt. Is it possible that he stayed as an Egyptian figure, a royalty? Just as a question, I was intrigued by another quote from the Exodus book, Sefer Shmot, with this quote. Veshalachti et atzirah lefanecha, vegersha et achivi, et aknani, vet achiti milfanecha. And I will send the tzirah, the tzirah in Hebrew means the, not the bee, the comet, how do you say? Hornet. Hornet, okay, thank you. And I will send the hornet in front of you, exactly what you see, the titulary of the king. And it will drive on the Hevite, the Kenites, and the Hittite from before you. You know, there is only one person in ancient Egypt that has this word in front of his name, and it will always be an Egyptian king. You can never get the bee or the hornet in front of your name unless you are royalty, unless you are a king. Is it possible, I'm just asking, not claiming, is it possible that we need to rethink about the figure of Moses? Is it possible that Moses could be depicted as an Egyptian king. And if you stay with me with this thought, think about what happened in Mount Sinai. You see, if my theory is correct and plausible, so what really happened is that all this Israeli tribe connected to the moon god and to this moon theology came to Mount Sinai with other people who believe in the same way. But something happened in Mount Sinai. You see, in Mount Sinai, they got the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are not part of the moon theology at all. They are part of the sun theology. So what really happened at Sinai? 
there was this mix between these two theologies together. There was a transformation because the Ten Commandments represent orders, represent rule. This is the sun element. Connected to the moon element, Moses created a new theology, a theology that actually embraced these two and tried to find a balance between them. And when I say a balance, it's not 50-50, but it's more moon, like 60% moon or 70% moon, and 30-40% sun. And for the first time in the human history, there was an attempt to bring these two centers together, to speak about peace, to bring a common language between the moon and the sun, and starting melting into one beautiful theology. Because if you think about it, even the geography of the land of Canaan is right in the middle in the middle of the sun and in the middle of the moon. And if we keep and asking ourselves, what could be the message of this story? Is it possible that there is another message that was lost in our translation when we read the story? Is it possible that the message, it was not only about being victim, but about finding common language about finding the truth, about finding common language between feminine and masculine. Because you see, the moon theology represents the feminine aspect. The sun represents the masculine aspect. So for the first time, what Moses created is a combination of men and women. The moon being represented sometimes by the color pink and red, and the sun is represented sometimes by the color blue. When you mix them together, what you get is purple. Maybe this is also another meaning of am segula, because segol means purple. So is it possible that there is another message to the story of Exodus? Is it possible that there was an attempt thousand years ago to find a balance between men and women? between moon and the sun to find this balance. But you see, to find this balance, it's so difficult because you're trying to mix two opposite directions. You cannot just do it just by knowing it. I'm a business of management. People are all the time telling me how to balance my life, right? Life, work, how to do it. It's hard just by knowing it. You need a manual. You need a manual that will help you to reach this balance. And maybe this is the goal of the Torah, of the mitzvot. Same manual that will help us each time in each situation, whether we should go toward the moon or we should keep and preserve and be more like the sun. So the message for me tonight is not saying that Ahmose is Moses just making it as an assumption and bringing the question out there. But I believe that there is another layer in the story, that if we really dig into the names of the story and we start asking questions, and we know that it's our, in our tradition, the tradition in the Haggadah is to ask questions all the time. Because by asking questions, <coughs> we can reveal another layer of the Bible. If my mother wouldn't ask me this question, I wouldn't go to this journey, mm -hmm. this fascinating journey that really brought me back to the field of Egyptology with a lot of passion. And I just want to remind you that all this journey started with just one word, the word Messiah, which became for me like a code name code name that once you reveal the nature of each sign, suddenly the whole story opens up in a different way. And I want to end up with a quote that maybe can explain what really happened to us here tonight. And this is a quote from the book of Isaiah saying, tear the sign or the letters backwards 
and we will know for you are God. You will even benefit and let us see and be amazed together. And this is exactly what happened when we reversed the name of Achmose and we read it backwards. I was amazed. I hope that you are too. Thank you for listening to me. I would like in this also occasion to thank my mother for not giving up my Jewish education. I want to thank my father for being so skeptical for being so skeptical and asking me to find facts all the time. I have to say that both of them encouraged me to continue my research. I want to thank Steven Spielberg for invoking me this fashion to learn the past. But most and foremost, I want to thank my three kids, Dr. Talon Tsai, for encouraging me to say my own truth. Even sometimes, it really gets a lot of courage. Thank you.